So, uh, yeah, I just started the recording. And so what, uh, just want to remind us that, uh, uh, like, whatever we are learning in this section that is winning with people is uh, uh, from, a, from a book by the same title by John C. Maxwell, uh, Winning with People. Um, I think I, I have a PDF of that book. Uh, I'll just put it on, I'll upload it uh, uh, for you in the resource section so you can read it. The only thing is that a lot of examples are all, uh, you know, very American. So, but it's it's still, um, I think it's good. Um, the illustrations are American, of course. Uh, you, know, you might talk about American football and all those things, but um, but I think it's it's still good uh, to go through. I just thought, uh, you know, uh, while we are going to be looking at uh, the charisma uh, principle and also um, the confrontation principle, uh, the next the the number ten principle, the the three other principles. I just thought it'd be good if we can if we can watch the video of uh, John C. Maxwell talking about these, right? So and then we could uh, maybe take a you know pause uh, wherever to talk about you know, or if we have some questions we can discuss that as well. Yeah, so let's uh, let's watch that video. Uh, let me just share that. Okay. Okay. And what they know will rub off. As Clifton and Nelson. Um, is it clear audio? Still, it's clear. It's clear. Okay, I'm just gonna yes, like switch off my camera so it, it doesn't buffer or anything, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And said, relationships help us define who we are and what we become. I have made it a habit in my life to every month have what I call a learning lunch and every month I seek out people most of whom I've never met it may be an author of a book that's going to be in a town where I'm going to go and I've read their book and I'll call and ask if I can have a lunch with them but every month I have a learning lunch at least one sometimes I get two or three in but I always have one always I always set up one for sure I mean get that one nailed down and in that learning lunch I have a series of questions I referred to in another lesson of, of having dinner with Jim Collins and Francis Hesselbein. I kid you not. I prepared four hours for that lunch. And when I went to the table, you see, most people, when they go to the table, they think they should eat food. I can eat food anywhere. I've got my questions. You eat the food, I'll ask the questions. And I asked the first question to Jim Collins. I said, would you talk to me about the value of curiosity? Because in your book, especially Good to Great, your curiosity is evident everywhere. I said, what is the value of curiosity? It took him 12 minutes to answer that question. He said, John, no one's ever asked me that question. He said, I love that question. He answered it. I went through others for him and for Francis. Every once in a while, they'd ask me a question. I'd give them a real quick, simple, stupid answer <laughs> and get right back to asking them questions because I learned a long, long time ago, if you're doing talking, you're not doing any learning. <laughs> we're in the car, and we're going back to the hotel. And Jim Collins turns around looks back at me. So let me talk to you a little bit more about curiosity in another five minutes. And I'm just sitting there taking notes. Some of my best thinking has been done by others. It's amazing what will happen if you have those learning lunches. Number four, identify people's uniqueness and strengths. Ralph Waldo Emerson remarked, I have never met a man who was not my superior in some particular. People grow best in the areas of their strengths, and you can learn most from another person's area of strength. So what you've got to do is identify your strengths and ask the questions in their strength zone. Number five, ask questions. Just have a learning 
value. The learning principle is huge. And I have watched people and realized that if you really want to develop strong relationships, ask questions and learn from people. And by the way, you create tremendous value when you're asking somebody to teach you something. People principle number nine, the charisma principle. The charisma principle says people are interested in the person who is interested in them. Or Dale Carnegie, the classic statement of all, I think. You can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. The question I must ask myself, do I usually focus on others and their interest or on my own? Many years ago, a, a person that I've had the privilege of mentoring, Dan Ryland, and I were having a discussion and he said to me, he said, John, you have charisma. And I said, well, I said, people tell me that. But I said, I think that's just kind of a gift that some people have, some people don't. And he stopped. He said, no, 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 you're wrong. I said, what do you mean I'm wrong? He said, charisma is not a gift. It's not a talent at all. It's a mindset. I said, what do you mean? And that day, he taught me a very valuable lesson about charisma. In your notes, people with charisma focus on others. That's what makes people like them. And people without charisma focus on themselves. It's a mindset. If you are focusing on others, I promise you, you'll develop a, a charismatic personality. If you focus on yourselves, hello. This is classic. This is Dale Carnegie, six ways to make people like you. Carnegie's teachings in the class and in How to Win Friends and Influence, people made a profound impression on me as a teenager. By the time I graduated, I had, with my father, taken two Dale Carnegie courses. In fact, they had such an impact that I've worked to pattern my people skills on much of what he taught. And here are six things Carnegie suggests, along with my explanation. Number one, become genuinely interested in other people. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. Number two, smile. You say, John, there's got to be more to it than that. No, really there isn't. Just smile. And people all the time will come to me and say, well, you know what, John, you just have this natural smile. You just, no, I don't. No, no. I don't have a natural smile. You don't have a natural smile. Nobody has a natural smile. We, we had to work our way out into this world. <laughs> Think about it. And as soon as we got, got out, the doctor looked at us and smacked us. No wonder we are negative the rest of our life. Should have picked us up and said, you're awesome. You're um, unbelievable. So I was in grade school. I looked in the mirror one day, and, and, and I looked in there, and I faced reality. He said, John, you are not a handsome dude. What, what are we going to do with a face like this? And then I smiled. And as soon as I smile, I thought, oh, 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 that helps. <laughs> it didn't heal me, but it helped me. I'm often amazed at people who go through a day and never smile. They're like the mother daughter who were doing the Christmas shopping. They've been to, to too many stores, and the, the feet were pretty sore on mom, and she was really grumpy as they made their last stop shop place, and they're coming out of that store about a half hour later, and her mother is just, she's now, she's, she's got a real attitude issue, and she said to her daughter, did you see the look that that salesperson gave me in that store? And her daughter said, Mom, that salesperson didn't give you that look. You had that when you went in. <laughs> Number three, remember that a person's name is to him or her the sweetest and most important sound. Major. Just understand that if you could remember a person's name. Number four, be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. Novelist George 
Eliot advised, try to care about something in this vast world besides the gratification of small selfish desires. Try to care for what is best in thought and action, something that is good apart from the accidents of your own life. Look on other lives besides your own. See what their troubles are and how they are born. You know, two of the greatest prime ministers in all of England's history was William Gladstone and ben Benjamin Disraeli. Both of them brilliant prime ministers, lived real, I mean, back to back. So England had some really good leadership for a period of time. And, and one lady who knew both of them was asked one time, she said, uh, compare William Gladstone to Benjamin Disraeli. Oh, she said, that's very easy. She said, when I'm with William Gladstone, after an evening conversation with him over dinner, I just look at him and say to myself, he is the most brilliant man in England. She said, when I spend an evening with Benjamin Disraeli, when I'm leaving him, I always say to myself, I am the most brilliant person in England. Two total different mindsets. Number five, talk in terms of the other person's interest. There's the golden rule. There's the platinum rule. The golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. The platinum rule, treat others the way that they want to be treated. Start with the golden and advance to the platinum. And number six, make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. I was recently having dinner out in uh, San Diego with a, a friend of mine. And we were both talking about a book that we both have enjoyed that uh, is entitled Now Discover Your Strengths. Marcus Buckingham, it's basically a book that has several, identifies and labels several different strengths a person may have. And you read the book and kind of understand them. And then you can even take a test on the computer uh, based on what your number is on your book. And it's a, it's a wonderful, enlightening exercise. And, and I took it. And, and he had taken it. And he looked at me and he said, John, he said, uh, let me ask you a question. He said, uh, what were your top five strengths? And, and I could only remember, I think, two of them. So I, I said, well, let's check with Linda. And I called her, and she had pulled out the test and told me. But one of my five strengths is what they call the woo factor. The woo factor basically is a, is a fact that you're able to woo people to you, that it has kind of that, again, that charismatic kind of feel to it. And he said, I knew that would be one of your five. He said, I knew that would be one of your five. And I said, oh, if you'd known me 20 years ago, it wasn't. He said, what do you mean by that? Oh, I said, uh, the first few years as I started off in my career, I wanted to impress people. I wanted to have people like me. I wanted people to think that I was smart. I used to do all kinds of stupid things. I, I, used to, I used to wear glasses so that people thought I was intellectual. I came out of college, and I thought that if I was intellectual, people would think that was wonderful. And... You know, one day my wife said, you look real stupid in those glasses. <laughs> and I took them off. I guess what I'm trying to share with you in this people principle, the, the charisma principle, is it really is a mindset. A and you don't have to be boring all your life. Boring people are into themselves. People with charisma are into others. People principle number 10. Now, the 10th people principle just happens to be the number 10 principle. In other words, believing the best in people usually brings the best out of people. I'm talking now about putting the number 10 on their head. Mark Twain said, keep away from people who try to belittle your ambitions. Small people always do that. But the really great make you feel that you too can become great. Now, the question I must ask myself is, do I believe the best of others? In other words, do I put a 10, this is the number 10 principle, do I put a 10 on their heads? Let me share with you five things I know about people. Well, probably 20 years ago, I was flying up to Spokane to speak at the convention center to a large group of people. And while I was on the plane, and this happens to me, not often, but sometimes, I sat down with my legal pad, and all of a sudden, I found myself beginning to write what I'm going to share. 
In fact, by the time I got to Spokane, I had my speech. I hadn't planned on using it as my speech. I had another one. But, but all of a sudden, I had, I, had a, I had one that was fresh, one that was kind of just from my heart. And it's about people and, and this whole number 10 principle. So there are five things I know about people. Number one, everybody wants to be somebody. I know that about people. Everybody wants to be somebody. George Adams states, there are high spots in all of our lives, and most of them have come about through the encouragement from someone else. I don't care how great, how famous or successful a man or a woman may be, each hungers for applause. When I lived in San Diego, it was just kind of a ritual of mine because it was always on the way to the gate where I would fly out to go speak somewhere that I would go by the shoeshine place. And Melvin, the shoe shine guy, was always there. And I would get my shoes shined whether they needed to be shined or not. And I would sit there as Melvin would shine my shoes, and I'd talk to him about Little League Baseball because that's what he had done all of his life. For over 40 years, he was a Little League Baseball coach. And I'd ask him about his teams and what were his best teams. And I think he had had three or four guys that he taught in Little League that went on into the majors, and I'd talk to him about that. But every time I'd leave him, I would give him a good tip, and I'd say to him, Melvin, one of my regrets in life is that I wasn't on your Little League baseball team. He'd smile and wave to me, and sometimes he'd say, oh, you should have been, John. <laughs> you should have been. Here's what I know. Here's what I know about Melvin. Here's what I know about you. Here's what I know about me. Everybody wants to be somebody. Number two. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. You may try to impress people with your knowledge, but you impact people with your compassion. Number three, everybody needs somebody. I love watching people sometimes who think they don't need anybody. Just hang around with them long enough, and you and I will get in enough trouble and deep enough weeds that we'll have to have somebody come and help us out and bail, bail us out. And number four, anybody that helps somebody influences a lot of bodies because influence grows and goes by adding value to others. And number five, somebody today will rise up and become somebody. And I can remember doing that that, that little lesson in Spokane, and it just kind of became something that I talk about once in a while because it's all about believing in people. Now, if you have a hard time believing in people, think about this. Number one, our disappointment in a few people should not stop us from believing in people. Too often, I find that if someone disappoints us, it causes us to pull away and stop believing in people. It's happened to me before. I can still remember my first staff hiring where I poured myself into a staff member only to have it work out real bad, real bad. Uh, finally, I had to let him go. And I can still remember saying to myself, wow, this is not good. I gave him a lot of my time, gave him a lot of my energy, still had to let him go. I didn't like this at all. In fact, uh, and I got close to him and I really cared for him and I got hurt by him. And I can still remember saying to myself, you know what? I know what I'm going to do. When I hire people from now on, I'm going to give them a job, and I'm going to have my job, and I'm not going to have a relationship with them at all. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to tell them, you know, you do your job, I'll do my job, and we'll meet at Christmas. <laughs> well, what I discovered is obvious to you already. The good news is if you don't let people close to you, they won't hurt you. The bad news is if, if you don't let people close to you, they won't help you either. And I began to learn very quickly that just because I had been disappointed in a relationship with someone doesn't mean that I should be disappointed with everyone. Number two, a trusting heart is emotionally healthy. In his book, The Trusting Heart, Dr. Williams, Director of Behavioral Medicine Research Center at Duke University Medical Center writes, those who have a trusting heart are more likely to remain healthy throughout most of their lives and to live long. He says that such a heart believes in the basic goodness of humankind, that most people will be fair and kind in relationships with others. 
A soft heart, he said, is more likely to be a healthy one. Number three, we behave in light of our beliefs. In other words, if you don't like people or don't believe in them, you really won't be able to fake it. Have you ever had somebody try to fake belief in you? Or they just kind of, you know, they just kind of tried to pump you up when you knew that they, it, was a, it was purely out of wrong motives. And, and, and it, you know, you can, it's just phony. You can just, you can see it. You can just smell it. You can see it and smell it coming is what you can. You don't want to go there. Number four, a healthy marriage is built on positive expectation. Marcus Buckingham, of course, I talked about this book earlier about now discover your strength, said the number one sign, this is amazing, the number one sign of a healthy marriage is that the spouses see each other more positively than other people do. And any time a partner esteems his or her spouse lower than outsiders do, it's a sign that there is trouble in the relationship. As I previously shared, I, I've done a little bit of counseling. Did, I've done quite a bit of marriage counseling, pre-marriage counseling. And I have come to discover that the only difference between pre-marriage counseling and counseling people whose marriage is in trouble is very simple. Before they're married, they believe the best in each other. I kid you not. I mean, they'll come in there and they'll sit in the office and, you know, you can't already get their attention. They're just looking at each other, you know. <laughs> And, and, and he doesn't have a job. And I'll point out, well, you don't even have financial security before you get, you, he doesn't even have a job. I know, but we'll find one. We love each other. And we only have one car. I know it, but he'll take me to work and then drop me off. You know, and I, in fact, I finally quit doing pre-marriage counseling because, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nobody's home. You know what I'm talking about? It's just nobody's home. You, you just, no matter what you say, it's okay, and it'll be wonderful, and yes, and I believe in him, and I, she's the most wonderful person. <laughs> Six months later, they're back in the office. They're married, and we got problems in River City. Do you know the difference between pre-marriage and marriage is very simple. Before you get married, you believe the best in the person, and when you get married and begin to know them, you begin to focus on the worst of the person. And that is the difference. It's focus. Before marriage, you put a tent on their heads. After marriage, you have a 1.5 on their heads. Number five, expressing belief in people's potential encourages them to reach their potential. It's not enough just to believe in people, to think that they are tens. You need to express that belief. Goethe said, treat a man as he appears to be, and you make him worse, but treat a man as if he already were what he potentially could be, and you make him what he should be. I truly believe in this principle. Try it. I know what you're thinking already. You're saying, well, if i got to put a ten on somebody's head, I think it's going to be... Probably not true because I think they're really a two. Well, then don't put a 10 on their head. Try a four or a five. Here's what I want you to do. Put a higher number on their head than you normally have and watch it how it changes the relationship. Because you and I, when somebody believes in us, we know it. And let me tell you about belief in people and having people believe in you. Your behavior around a person that believes in you is much better than it is around a person who doesn't believe in you. You will do everything, and I will do everything in my power, never to pull down the expectations that people have in us. People principle number 11. Probably of all the people principles, this is the most difficult. Okay, so uh, probably we'll share our thoughts. Are there any questions? So we looked at two, right? Uh, the charisma principle, 
which is about uh, being interested in people and caring for people and um, and really those some of those practical things um, that that really draws people to us and uh, uh, in our effort to be other focused right and then we looked at the number 10 principle which means you know uh, why we say 10 is uh, 10 is actually considered to be a perfect score uh, yeah that's true john so much of charisma will be talking also um yeah you know the 10 is considered to be a you know perfect score like in gymnastics or diving uh, it's a perfect score right if you notice uh, that each of those three judges who are there will have the score is out of 10 so if somebody scores a 10 means it's you know they the score the perfect score uh the maximum that is possible so when you say we put a 10 on that person we are esteeming that person um uh, that uh, so much higher right that they are the best so um yeah so uh you know what what has been your experience maybe your uh any questions on that maybe your uh, misgivings on that um Anything at all? I just want to share uh, what I learned. Yes, I was really blessed through the session. And uh, I just felt that uh, we say love people, and it, it's a very easy sentence. But there is a lot of work in it to give the importance to them, to make them, uh, mm -hmm. to see them, uh, to ex have the exchange principle. So, big picture principle. There's a lot of principles, there's a lot of work on it. And I also loved uh, when he said uh, uh, a trusting heart is emotionally healthy. And, and I remembered every verse in the Bible about trust. And uh, I felt that, yeah, when we trust God, we are also emotionally healthy. And that was, that, that really hit me, like, oh, a trusting heart is emotionally healthy. Sometimes all that we need to do is, is to have someone to trust. So, mm -hmm. yeah, this, I think I'll, I'll really work on every single thing that we learned today. Uh, this is what I learned. Like, loving people has some work behind the scenes, actually. <laughs> yeah, true. Thanks, Jefina. Thank you. Yeah, the, 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 the whole thing of trust, no? Like, um, not letting the disappointment of uh, people disappointing us, you know, some people disappointing us, uh, let it not stop us from trusting people. And we see this in the life of you know the Lord Jesus. Um, and sometimes you know we are we are really amazed. You know how can he trust Peter? Right? How can he trust Peter after he denied him thrice? Right? And to such an extent, how can he even trust him? Uh, how can he say? you know, Peter, right, feed my lambs, and uh, how can he do that, right? Um, of course, he brought P Peter to a place of restoration, right? We need, to, uh, we need to acknowledge that. He brought Peter to a place of restoration, and of course, Peter was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, these two things happened, but the fact is that the Lord trusted him. The Lord cared for him uh, enough right, um, to, tr to trust him again. Well, that's a, that's a big one, right? So, so in, in practically work, yeah, yeah, Divya, you have a... Oh, sorry, Pastor, I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> no worries, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, uh, same here. I, I was just, uh, as I was hearing, like how, uh, to give a score of at least, you know, uh, to another person whom you may think a score of two, mm. uh, at least give a higher score, right? And uh, how the relationship is uh, changed and progressing. Uh, so I, I was just fondly remembering all those people uh, who, even in my life uh, journey, uh, when I was not able to believe, there were people who believed that I you that you could do it or yeah it's um, you have the potential or mm -hmm. those, those encouragements i fondly remember those people and yeah even um that motivates us also to do that to others right uh, it's not right. that we receive that but we can even give that 
uh, also uh, uh, it was very interesting to hear the platinum rule uh, mm -hmm. that uh, treat others as they want to be treated uh, yeah and also loved how he brought uh, the the concept of you know the relation marriage relationship into it mm. uh, and uh, it's a very good point uh, like if we are looking at you know that the best in the other person yeah it's a healthy yeah it's a very good point uh, actually yeah yeah it's, it's that way yeah yeah so true so true yeah because uh, i mean it's a difficult thing again like jeffina was saying to practically work that out you know in loving others and also believing the best of people especially when they let you down um and of course about again a process of you know uh let's say when when we want to entrust responsibilities i'm just talking about you know maybe a leader team leader uh, maybe a very uh, you know formal leadership maybe in a secular setting also like if we want to entrust that same responsibility uh, we just need to make sure that uh, uh, you know that they are in that place of uh, let's say repentance that they they are ready again right uh, in order to for us to really trust and do that but uh, if they are in that place and uh, you know are we are we still viewing them with suspicion you know that's the that's the thing that's the question right? um, because uh, you know, many times uh, you know the, our life can be full of suspicion and we can wrongly call it as discernment right so Sus being suspicious uh, is not discernment discernment is something else right uh, so um, so we need to make that difference distinction that it's not you know, suspicion. Um, yeah. And also, uh, just a quick thing about, uh, you know, he quotes from about Dale Carnegie. And uh, like, I really do not know where Dale Carnegie's faith is, you know, like most of these sources. Um, they are, these are people known for their practical wisdom, the, the, the places where he's quoting from and so on. Like they, um, so I just wanted us to you know, reminders of that, right? Some of these sources that he's quoting from may not be necessarily Christian. Right? And uh, and the fact is that Lord is God is using him in a you know cutting across um, across religious platforms, cutting across denominations, and so on. And in a, in a place like uh, you know in a uh, well, if you want to call it that, the mountain of business, right? seven mountains the mountain of business um and to bring in to usher in these principles which is which is amazing that a lot of people respect a lot of people receive it a lot of people practice it and it's it's coming into the uh, uh in, in the corporate sector you know that is that is amazing that to be a voice uh of a voice of truth in the corporate sector where the lord you know gives that kind of sphere of influence so um that's that's really amazing so uh, you know that's something to really admire and to be inspired about that the lord can actually do that with a person with a life that is yielded because um then john c maxwell he had a you know thriving congregation i think uh, a few thousands uh, if you look at this uh, you know church ministry and so on and, but then the lord said okay you need to do this and then expanded the scope and and uh, really widened the uh, sphere of influence to that extent right okay okay let's uh, we have some more time so let's watch the rest of the video and uh, yeah let's just take some time to do that The confrontation principle basically says caring for people should precede confronting them. Conflict is like cancer. Early detection increases the possibility of a healthy outcome. And the question I must ask myself is, do I care enough to confront the right way? Now, let me just stop here for a moment. Let's go back to what this principle is all about. Caring for people should precede confronting them. In fact, I'm going to go out on the limb here. If you don't care for them, 
My guess is that if you do confront them, you will do it incorrectly. The foundation of confrontation must be a desire to help people, not a desire to hurt people. That is the line I always look for. When somebody says, I've got to go confront somebody at work. I've got to go confront somebody. I've got to, I've got to confront somebody in the family. If I have a moment, I always ask them, do you really care for that person? And do you really desire for them to succeed? If so, go confront. But if somehow you're wanting to give them a piece of your mind, you're wanting to put them in their place, you're wanting to let them know where they stand, we have trouble. So comments about conflict, one, it's unavoidable. You know, they, what do they always say, death and taxes, you know what I mean? Let me tell you something else, conflict. When you deal with people, you know, as long as Adam lived alone, there was not much conflict. Although most people I know, if they lived alone and met no one else, they would still have major conflict. <laughs> I have met the enemy, and it is me. But when Eve appeared, sparks are going to fly. Number two, it's, it's difficult. Confrontation is, is, is difficult. In fact, it was, I used to do a, a, a conference on how to confront and how to deal with conflict. And I would always ask this question, how many of you right now have conflict with somebody? And every, it would be 100%. Everybody raised their hand. If I ask you today, everybody has conflict with somebody. We all do. I do. You do. We all do. Okay. But interesting enough, I'd say, how many of you have sat down in a correct way privately and dealt with the issue with that person? And we would go from 100% to about 5%. In other words, the vast majority of the people have really never done or dealt with the situation. So, number three, how we handle conflict determines our success in tough situations. For example, let me give you some wrong strategies in dealing with conflict. Strategies such as um, win at all cost. That's not why you have confrontation. That's not why you deal with conflict. Your goal isn't to win at all costs. It's, it's, it's like a, a shootout at the OK Corral. It's quick, brutal, and destructive. Or here's another wrong strategy. Pretend it doesn't exist. If you hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil, evil will not cease to exist. Or three, oh, this one's very hard on me, whine about it. I have a heavy dislike for whiners. Winners aren't whiners, and whiners aren't winners. And playing the victim doesn't cure the conflict. It just irritates everybody. At least it irritates me. Or another wrong strategy is keep score. <laughs> People who keep a record of wrongs can't ever start over fresh, and nobody can ever get even. Don't you know some people, they just keep score. They just keep score. Another one is pull rank. Using position never really resolves conflict. It, it merely postpones it. Or sometimes we white flag it, which is pure surrender. We just quit. So let me give you what I would call a roadmap for healthy confrontation. Conflict resolution isn't complicated. Intellectually, it's simple, but emotionally, it can be difficult. It requires honesty, humility, and dedication to the relationship. Here's the six-step plan. Number one, confront a person only if you care for that person. We've already talked about that. But always check your heart before you confront. Number two, meet together as soon as possible. In other words, if there is conflict to deal with and confrontation, it doesn't help in just constantly delaying it. In fact, in your second paragraph in your note, consultant Fred Smith, who has been one of my mentors in leadership, spoke of his experience. Here's what he said, whenever I'm tempted not to act in a difficult personnel situation, I ask myself, am I holding back for my personal comfort or am I holding back for the good of the organization? And I thought, what a wonderful way to separate emotionally because we all hold back. Because Let me tell you something. Let me just do a little survey. How many of you have ever had to confront somebody on something, uh, on something and perhaps procrastinated a little bit? before doing it. Boy, that, 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 that is the common denominator of all of us, isn't it, huh? We know we should, but boy, we find 17 reasons why, and, and why we shouldn't, couldn't, and haven't. Fred Smith said, 
when I'm holding back in confrontation, am I doing that because of me personally? Or am I doing that for the good of the organization? There, because for their example, maybe a, a leader will have to hold back for a period of time because it's the timing's not right. But am I doing it? Am I doing it, doing it because the timing's not right or am I doing it because I'm not ready to do it yet? By the way, the reason I say confront as soon as possible, there is a, a thing that I see that causes tremendous problems. I call it gunny sacking. I don't, that's not the right word, but... But basically, it's where somebody has issues with somebody, and instead of telling them, they just put it in the gunny sack. And they just keep putting stuff in there. And one day, all hell breaks loose. And they start talking, and they say, well, let me tell you this, and by the way, and then there's this issue, and then we got that issue, and four years ago, that happened, and, and they just kill them. And I've always had a very simple principle with anybody I've ever worked with, all the presidents of my companies, anybody I've ever worked with, I have a very simple principle. If there is a problem, you will know about it immediately. You never need to look at me and say, is he having a problem with me? Does he have an issue with me? Is there something he needs to fix? No, no, no. You will know about it immediately. I never gunny sack because I don't want it to happen to me from someone, and I would never do it to someone else. Number three, first seek understanding, not necessarily agreement. Now, this is where conflict many times in confrontation does not succeed. We're trying to get agreement instead of understanding. Now, let me go on here. A significant hindrance to positive conflict resolution is having too many preconceived notions going into a confrontation. There's a saying, the person who gives an opinion before he understands is human, but the person who gives a judgment before he understands is a fool. Abraham Lincoln was well known for his tremendous people skills. He remarked, when I'm getting ready to reason with a man, I spend one-third of my time thinking about myself and what I'm going to say, and two-thirds of the time thinking about him and what he's going to say. What a good rule of thumb. Kettering said, there's a great difference between knowing and understanding. You can know a lot about something and not really understand it. Number four, outline the issue. And I have three thoughts about under, outlining the issue. Describe your perceptions and, and let them know when you describe your perceptions that what I see could be totally wrong. Please feel free to correct me. Two, tell how it makes you feel. Let them know if it makes you angry or if it frustrates you. And finally, explain why this is important to you. Here's the reason we're talking about this. It's not to make me feel better. It's, we're talking about this because we have to fix it so that our relationship can be what it can be and we can do things successfully together. Okay, number five, encourage a response. One statement out of that long paragraph. One of the best ways to persuade others is with your ears, by listening to them. When confronting people, I've discovered the following. This is very true. 50% of the time, people don't realize there is a problem. In other words, when you sit down and confront people, half the time they didn't realize there was even a problem. So therefore, in confronting them, it's just kind of like, oh my goodness, thanks for telling me. I didn't, I didn't, have, I didn't have a clue. 30% of them realized there was a problem, but they didn't know how to solve it. So the very fact that you're sitting down with them is helping the two of you to solve it, and 20% realized that there was a problem, but they did not want to solve it. The bad news is that one out of five people really does not want to seek positive resolution. The good news is that 80% of the time, there is great potential to solve the conflict. Okay. We've been talking about the connection level in relationship. There's the big picture principle. The entire population of the world, with one minor exception, is composed of others. The exchange principle, instead of putting others in their place, we must put ourselves in their place. These all are people principles that help us connect. The learning principle. Each person we meet has the potential to teach us something. The charisma principle, people are interested in the person who is interested in them. The number 10 principle, believing the best in people usually brings out the best in people. And the confrontation principle, caring for people should precede confronting people.
Well, that was nice, wasn't it? Uh, confrontation principle. And uh, and I think that was an eye opener, you know, that um, like, I don't know how far the, those percentages are accurate, but then really it helped give us a, you know, an idea. 50% don't know there's a problem and, uh, you know, 30% know there's a problem, but don't know how to solve it. And it's only that 80% which actually know there's a problem and don't want to solve it. Right, so actually, the eighty percent—I mean, the twenty percent. So the eighty percent actually, you know, is a good number to work with, um, and uh, you know, to enable to help. And then, of course, there is that twenty percent which don't want to solve it, which is when, when we need to reason with, and uh, and then those three, three things, right? That uh, that you want to understand, and also. Um, I forget the, the second one, but the third one is that uh, that this is why it is important that you want to solve it, and so uh, to get them also, you know, on the same page, right? Okay, but but a lot depends on us, like the whole thing of caring before converting or confronting, you know, where we prepare our hearts, you know, and so true that we go before the Lord and we. We, uh, you know, prepare our hearts that there is no bitterness and hatred and and bias and you know all that and all the things of the past is not resident within. So we just get all those things sorted, uh, and that happens when we are, you know, when we go before the Lord, where He's able to just, you know, give a clean slate and, and remove all that thing, and then we go empowered and free, right? Empowered. By the Holy Spirit, and really free in our spirit to 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 love the person, to solve, and uh, you know, having a clear mind as well to to solve the issue. You know, objectivity and everything flows from that place. Right? Okay, so we will we'll stop here, and then uh, we'll pick it up uh, next uh, next class. So there will also be an online um, you know quiz coming up. So we'll we'll just put it on the stream, and it'll have a submission date as well. So you can be you know you can just prepare for that. So online students, I mean um, uh, e-learning students also, it'll be there. Um, you know it'll be uh, shared sometime this week, and uh, you can look out for that. Okay, thank you. God bless. See you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. -bye.